was never enough. Over here is AJ Novello. Give him a clap. Come on. The band alcoholic Mikey Givens. Behind on the drums is Pokemon. And this fucking wooden up here is Jimmy the Poodle. And I joined Lee Way back in 1987. And it was uh, an experience, for sure. Certainly an experience. A great one at times. And a bad one. For most times, to be honest with you. A lot of bands took notice of us right away because they watched our growth each of the first three years before we signed with our first record deal that you couldn't ignore it. I was very, and I'll always say this, I was always blessed to have the musicians with me in order to do what I got to do as a vocalist because, um, you know, it, we as a whole and as a team and as a unit really got to make a statement and put our own stamp on this thing of ours. In my first show with Suicidal Tendencies and Carnivore at uh, Urban Plaza in New York City on October 3rd, 1987. And then we went up to Normandy Sound War Rhode Island to record the first record, Born to Inspire. Been a big fan since uh, the Enforcer demo 1985. Actually reviewed that demo for my fanzine then when uh, Born to Expire came out, I think they just changed the game for New York hardcore, New York crossover, whatever you want to call it. I had only had two gigs under my belt. We went up to record Born to Expire, November 16th to the 20th of 87. Wait, how long was, did it take to record that? Four days, 16th to the 20th. Four, four days for that record, really? Yeah. How long to knock out all those oh, it was like, instruments? It was like 16-hour days. Each day was, you know. Yeah. I mean, Eddie did his vocal tracks in a good, like, it didn't take him long at all. Eddie, Eddie was, you know, fire and brimstone at the time. He knocked everything out in like three hours. I remember we went to a place called The Living Room, a club, to see the Ramones. And when we got back, Eddie's vocal tracks were done. And Chris Williamson couldn't be happier because it saved a lot of money, which he ended up pocketing probably. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> of leeway they just came on and you know right off the bat that intro you know place started going crazy um it was so powerful it was just it, un, unbelievable the tightness the the heaviness 
and you know Eddie's up there, his his swagger and you know breaking balls and just it was just so in your face and wow, I, everybody was blown away. Actually, I recorded the set on my radio. I used to do that. I used to bring my radio to shows and record the shows. So this is that tape. <laughs> Obviously, it was at a time where the internet wasn't big or social media. We didn't have anything like that. So how we would find out about shows was usually from being at another show and somebody would be handing out flyers. It was always flyers. That's how we found out about everything. So we would get a flyer that would say, hey, you know, Leeway is going to be at Lemoore. And we'd be like, oh, my God, this is going to be a great show. We have to go. Always. We would always have to go see Leeway because we knew it would be great music and awesome people and just a really, really fun, fun time. What do I say about Leeway? <laughs> huge inspiration to the band Enrage, my band. Huge inspiration to me. I think the first time I saw Leeway, I went to go see them live. And I think one of the things that really caught my eye was seeing Mike Gibbons on stage. Because he was a long haired dude. He was like head banging and thrashing. And I, if my memory serves me correct, he had like a Rush shirt on. And to me, that had balls because, you know, he was like some Hesher guy. You know, he looked like me. He had long hair, and he was some metal dude playing in a hardcore band. And that left such a big impression on me that you could really look the way you wanted to. And then also, obviously, Eddie, what really struck out about Eddie was his showmanship, was that he, he was a showman, and he didn't do a lot of the stuff Again, that other front men were doing in the hardcore scene. He knew how to work a crowd. And, you know, to a lot of people, that's, that's considered a negative thing, being a showman. But I looked at it as a positive. And he had a clear voice. You know, I, at one point, everybody was just barking and growling and trying to get heavier and heavier. And then he had a really clear voice. And now he stuck out with me. You know, it's great living out here on the West Coast. I get people all the time when I wear my Born to Expire shirt, you know, at a show or just down the street going, yeah, man, great fucking band, great an album, you know, and so uh, that's leeway for you. They're one of the best, you know, one of my favorite all-time bands, obviously being a Queens kid too, that doesn't hurt either. I remember going to Lemoore every weekend, and I remember the first time I saw Leeway. I don't even remember who they opened up for, Rise and Fall came on, and I was just like, whoa, who is this band? The energy in the room is insane. Oh, man. Powerful riffs, great lyrics, great songs. I believe Maximum Rock and Roll once wrote, uh, Leeway was the Berlin Wall between punk and metal. Delay in releasing the record. We wanted to get the record out by, say, January or February of 88, but both our records, the label we were signed to, was just a horrible record. A horrible, horrible people running it, a horrible business acumen. Just very bad at what they did. They, they smothered their bands. They signed us, Rookie's Law, Cormax, as guinea pig bands, and they threw us against the wall. Stick to stick before you fall. Well, you're not going to put a dime's worth of promotion into the bands that you expect them to sell records. I'm going to say this and I'm going to sound like a hypocrite. Six weeks, all right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We ain't that happy either. It's almost four years, man. We have no fucking vinyl out. Yeah. Don't blame me. What a phone number 529 2600. It's number profile. Try to get in touch with Chris and ask him, yo, where the fuck is that album? It's been done since March. Till I know, it's done since March. 
My very first uh, touring experience in, uh, was in 1989. So, Leeway's very first tour. Um, we got picked up on a tour by uh, the Bad Brains, and they did a, a U.S. tour. We did about 30 shows, I guess, in about 40 days, all around the, the U.S. Um, at the time, we, we were managed by someone who didn't. I don't know. I'm not even going to mention his name. But anyway, we went on. It was, uh, it was the five of us uh, band members, and we had like uh, I guess like two guys helping us, so seven of us. And then on top of that, we had a, I think we had a sound man or something, uh, slash tour manager. Um, so that that's eight of us, and uh, we went in a, in a cargo van with no seats, and uh, with all of our equipment piled up in the back, and we were all just kind of like uh, laying on top of the equipment for the first uh, few shows until uh, Bad Brains were generous enough to, to take all of our equipment on and also took uh, two of our roadies on their tour bus. So it was just, uh, you know, there was, uh, so there was a little bit more room for us in, in a cargo van. With, uh, with Bad Brakes, uh, we broke down countless number of times. You know, not only that, we did all the driving, the band members, me and Pokey, uh, my drummer. We did most of the driving, sometimes the bassist, Jimmy DePoodle, he would throw in three or four hours behind the wheel, but we did, he did, Pokey used to drive overnight, and uh, sometimes, I, and I drove through the days, you know, we're talking about nine hour clips. Now, I'm not talking about being Paul Stanley or Gene Simmons here and having multi-million dollar touring budgets and then, you know, fill in the marinas every night. I, I understand that. But, you know, it would be nice just to tour like a human being once. I remember bringing, <clears throat> bringing seats from my Camaro. I pulled seats out of my Camaro, my 71 Camaro, and I put them in the, <laughs> in one of the vans that we borrowed from Mike Stravis. And... You know, that, that's a life-changing experience for anybody who's never been on the road. The first road experience. And, um, and we were just lucky enough to, to have a band like the Bad Brains uh, take us, like take us under their wing. And I guess that's what you know the do-it-yourself punk rock hardcore bands like. That's what that's what we're all about. We're all about uh, helping each other. We're not about like competing. You know, we're not about like uh, oh you have too much space on on the stage or none, none of that because they were they were they were. A few shows where we would, we would pull in and the promoter would be like, "Oh, you guys aren't on the bill. And they wouldn't want to. They would. They wouldn't want to pay us. They wouldn't. They wouldn't even want to let us in, into the venue." And the bad brains would totally just like protect us and say, "Oh, if these guys aren't aren't going to play, we're not going to play. And if you're not going to pay them, we're not going to play." So, you know that that for me changed my entire life because anytime I'm on tour. Uh, I feel like that's what I, I, I should give back to whoever, you know, whatever band that's out there that's, that's opening up for, for us. Like nobody approached me, really. nobody wanted to get involved with the band, and I don't understand why. I don't know if it was Eddie's silver tongue, it's big mouth. I mean, it's all the bands on the regular. Uh, the band appeared to be a standoffish band. I always tried to be very inclusive to my fans, to our fans, and speak to people. I can't say the same about other members of the band, to be honest with you, but uh, that's just me. My drummer, Pokey, got me the, uh, the uh, phone number for Jimmy Archie, he was artist relations for Gibson. And I was like, oh, thanks, you know, maybe you can call him, see if you can get a half endorsement on him. So I get the guy a call one day. And it's a weekday, it's Wednesday, I'm at work, at my day job, um, when I was a beer holder. And I'm, uh, I'm on the phone, phone's ringing, phone's ringing, dial number, and I hung up. I remember feeling so ashamed and so bad that I'm the artist. Why am I calling this guy for an endorsement? 
Well, I had management that's supposed to be doing right now. Even though I wasn't signed to the to the regular to the management contract, he should at least should have been doing that for Asian Novello and and Pokey uh, as far as sticks or drums or cymbals. But if AJ would have got himself a half Gibson endorsement from this manager, I would have been able to get one myself. Then I would have thought twice about signing this contract. Oh, maybe this guy is pretty good. I was uh, familiar with the band in the late 80s, early 90s. I grew up in uh, Huntington Beach, which was a big Huntington Beach, California. A lot of uh, my friends were punk rock, you know, it was a big punk rock place. And, you know, I was really into the crossover bands like Suicidal and, of course, the Crow Mags and kind of getting into it. But I was always a metalhead. So it had to have like loud, aggressive, you know, killer guitar work and that kind of stuff. And, you know, I heard a lot of talk about Leeway, but I don't think it was till maybe 89, 90, I guess, when, when I finally heard the band. And uh, I was truly blown away. Again, you know, coming from the standpoint of a metalhead, uh, I thought it was cool. It was different. And um, it was definitely aggressive. And I dug it. We're Leeway! Touring like the way Leeway toured and, and low, low budget bands where you receive zero tour support from a record label and an abysmal manager, an abysmal management situation where we didn't even, we had, we didn't even have t-shirts, we had no merchandise, we had nothing, this guy did nothing for us, our manager, just a, one of the worst managers ever. It was all distribution, Chris Williams and our, the manager of the band I wanted to get a better distributor because Profile wasn't doing anything for any of the other than on the MC. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a curriculum label, and uh, they weren't distributing Chromax properly, Alex you know, Murphy's Law, or, or, uh, Orgasm, you remember them, they yes. were from New England. And uh, he just, from what I understand, he, he was asking for too much money. He, he wanted too much money for three bands that he was representing to distribute their records worldwide to get major distribution for them. And, you know, everybody else was turning them down, and the same thing happened with Desert Measures. I mean, he was asking, we had a lockdown deal with, with an effective time. Ali Aiden was going to sign us, you know, Ali was like, but like, you know, Chris Williamson kept asking for too much money, like, because he wanted to, this guy was a common thief, he just wanted to pocket whatever he could pocket, and that, that's why we were stuck with Profile all those years, and why the band really never went anywhere, that's why we ran, the career, and our career was killed by Profile Records. It seems like he fucking, like I said, from reading, things in books and hearing things from other people who work with them, you know, that nobody has anything ever really nice to say. I mean, I mean, Matt, listen, managers are going to be scumbags, but it depends on how much of a scumbag you want to be. Seems like he was a scumbag to the umph degree. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, where, to the point where he would, he would argue with AJ, well, doesn't anybody in the band have any money to buy t-shirts? And it's like, listen, you're the manager, you're supposed to be supplying the stuff. And, and if you manage the band, instead of mis mismanage the band, if you manage the band correctly, the band will see a profit. You know, and it just never happened. He, he was just too much into a quick cash grab right there and that. So he wasn't up for putting some money to make t-shirts, even if he made his money, first money, first money in, first money out? He, I think he got, I think he funded for t-shirts once on the, on the Born to Expire tour with Bad Brains, when we were supporting Bad Brains in, on the U.S. Legend tour. The record came out, we all, of course, we all went and got it and we're just blown away and of course, uh, that next year and a couple years on, we, you know, we opened up for Leeway many, many times and the guys were just great, you know. I thought they were just going to be a massive, massive band. Um, Eddie is a front man, the, the guitar tones on those records and the playing, the dual guitar thing. I got to say that re-listening re to uh, the material, man, I got to say that Michael Gibbons is really uh, the secret weapon here, man. He no really... Question. He really brought, he brought it to the party, man. He really was the, the element that really made Leeway uh, somewhat uh, you, you know, unique. I, well, I gotta, let me break I, I it down say, for you so you have yeah, a better please. understanding. Every neighborhood 
in Queens had this like idiot savant type of guitar player that took a million lessons over their teenage years, could play every rock riff and lead under the sun. But when you ask them to create something original, they couldn't do it. Michael was a step above that where he could do all the old, all the modern stuff, the old stuff. And if you asked him to do, you know, a, a 25 second lead, he'd be able to whip up some of the most phenomenal shit in the world. And, and again, yes, you're right. It, it truly was a secret weapon behind yeah. the collaborations that me and AJ were, were forming and writing. One time we were at Lemoore and um, hanging at the bar with my friend and we look across and and there's Mike and you just couldn't miss him with his with his hair and he's drinking his Heinegans and just being really friendly and everybody's coming up to him and wanting to shake his hand and you know he's just talking to everybody and that's how we met that night and we were friends ever since. <laughs> The work I put into everything, I, I saw nothing coming back out. Nothing. You know, when you see bands just blown by you, getting signed to better record label deals, major label deals, way better management to, to, to secure and garner those deals and secure them, you gotta, you gotta start looking at the management and asking yourself questions. What the hell was wrong with this guy managing this? The record company we knew was for crap. The total profile of the record was just horrifying shit. And, um, but our manager was just, he had ju big juice for tours. He was able to get us, get, you know, big bills and big shows, but this guy wouldn't spread it for t-shirts. That's why there's no leeway merchandise out there. Hokey and I were the only guys that had full-time jobs at one point. We, we were financing the band. We were buying the t-shirts. <laughs> Anyway, you go on the road, Bad Rings, sold out U.S. tour, come back, Europe, come back, everything's great. April of 1990, we go on to record that from Measure, the second leader record, which geared a lot more toward heavy metal. Supposedly the vocals on Desperate Measures have been compared to Ozzy vocals, but um, um, simple thing is, it's, it's, it was just simple double tracking, two tracks you know, of the same vocal, the same melody, and if you do you put the two tracks together, you get that shimmery kind of sound that, um, you know, that people say sounds like Ozzy. She probably did the same thing on his album. I would have liked to have recorded under more comfortable circumstances, maybe 10 hour days, but I mean, we, 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 were, getting, we were getting up at 6 a.m. and work until friggin' midnight because this Chris Williamson guy was like, he wanted to save as much money as he could from the recording budget to pocket. And I kept telling this to everybody. I was like, listen, screw this guy. We have every right to see the budget. We have every right to see the papers, but nobody ever called him on it. Alex. And I was always the troublemaker. I was always, you know, Williams always pointed to me, you're the troublemaker, you're always asking questions. And I'm like, you're damn skippy, because no one else is. There's just always been a favorite band of mine. Always. Uh, and I just feel like they got better with each album. Eddie's voice is amazing. You know, you got the crunching of the guitars with his melodic, funky, 
raw voice. Lee Wei, I mean, I'm just such a huge fan. Ever since I saw the Kingpin video on Headbangers Ball back in 1990, I had to, you know, find out more about them. I checked out Born to Expire, and I was just blown away with the brutality of that record and just both those records, that and Desperate Measures, are just, they're, they're in a regular rotation, they're just classics. And not just New York hardcore classics to me, they're just classic records, you know, metal hard rock records. But right now, here's Leeway. I saw this band play Lemores. They opened up for Suicidal Tendencies, as a matter of fact. Very cool, a lot of energy. They emerged from the New York hardcore scene, and they combine a style of kind of rap, hip-hop, and thrash. And here is uh, the debut of Kingpin from Leeway. <laughs> I mean, they had everything going for them. The great front man, they had the two shredding guitarists and just the tight as fuck, you know, rhythm section. During the recording of Born to Expire, Tony Glantol, the drummer, yeah. when we were doing Unexpected, the guy was physically unable to play any longer. He was about to collapse, and Chris Williamson comes into the room screaming, oh, I hope you have $700 to pay back the record company because you're ruining the recording budget right now. We are now, now it's delays and everything, and Zowie's like, yo, you know, we were not, I was 19 years old at the time. Zowie yeah. was a 27-year-old man. He was like, yeah. yo, you, don't, you can't talk to us like that. You, you can't blame the band. This guy's been playing drums all day. 16 hours, you can't do it anymore. We're gonna do it tomorrow morning. Let him get a good night's sleep. We'll be up at six in the morning. The delays on the records, you know, the delay, you know, the record, each record came out a year plus than it should have came out. Funny enough. The buzz dies. Well, and the funny enough, we had, me and my friends actually had a bootleg of Desperate Measures like six months before it came out because it was a tape. Exactly. Around. I, I remember hearing, hearing uh, Born to Expire coming from Evan's car, Evan, Evan Seinfeld. Yeah. Uh, when they first formed Biohazard in 88, him and Bobby were in the car listening to Rough Nets. Between uh, 89 and maybe 91, um, Lee Wei played a show at, at the uh, Old Bridge, which is now Webster Hall. There was a special guest in the audience that night. Uh, that was David Bowie. He had a, a reserve table in the balcony. During our set, uh, Eddie had a wireless mic, and he was able to climb the uh, climb the, uh, uh, the PA stacks, and get up to the balcony, and then he went around to all the tables and he stopped at David Bowie's table and and he you know sang a vocal like right in his face. And um, I guess uh, he, he got something out of that because the next thing that we seen of David Bowie was um, uh, he had this band called Tin Machine. He did a, a music video in the Ritz with a, with a hardcore audience um, and Harley Flanagan stage diving. I think he ripped somebody off. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, you know seeing a hardcore show affected him in, in, in a way that. You know, he saw something exciting in this type of music and wanted to to uh, to uh, get a foothold or, or try to get get you know get into that kind of scene. About desperate measures, mm. uh, the king, the kingpin video got some MTV play, and and uh, you know that got out there, man. That that really put you guys on the map in a lot of ways. Is that correct? It did. 
it definitely did. Like, you know, even though 89, the Bad Brains taking us through America really had a lot to do with uh, just kids showing up at the Bad Brain show, getting to see another New York band that could put on such a strong, powerful live show and, you know, basically kick your teeth in. Uh, the, the Kingpin video was pretty good for that time and place. So then to later on gig with them and, and, and do a bunch of shows with them, uh, and become friendly with them was, it really meant a lot to me. And then later on, I have Mike, it's so weird how things turned out. Like, you know, Mike wound up filling in on a couple of raid shows. He joined us in the reunion and it's kind of come full circle. Cause I'm one of the newer songs we have destroy. And he did uh, some guest spots on vocals. So leeway was always really, really important to me. We got a hold of this uh, live soundboard tape, CBGB's, it's, it's actual tape. Being that it is a live tape and, you know, a copy of a tape, which was probably many copies, the sound quality is just okay, but me and my friends, you know, were like really blown away by the band. They used to cover uh, a song called Hocus Pocus from a band called Focus, an old 70s band. They finished their set and we were, everybody was just blown away and just wanted more. And I, Eddie, you know, says it on the tape, but we've never had an encore, so we're going to do this song for you. And, well, I don't know if they ever recorded it, but I got a copy and I'll tell you, it's... <laughs> it's amazing. When I was doing the driving, 10 hour days, Pokey was doing the driving after the gig for the nights. One night Pokey couldn't drive, he said, the, the infamous, I'm too stoned to drive one night. And uh, I drove, a, I, I, I'm drunk driving, fucking driving through some god forsaken part of New, New Mexico or wherever we were. We were trying to get back to, uh, we were trying to get through Albuquerque or Phoenix or, I don't know, but I, I, I don't know how I saw it the last second. I had sunglasses on, the visor on, the sun was still just killing us. So, uh, uh, you know, somehow I just saw the guardrail end, and I jogged up. I jogged left, woke everybody up. And if I didn't jog left, we would have been, we would have rolled into the Grand Canyon. I just pulled over and said, "Listen, this is this is terrible. Van shouldn't be touring like this. This guy, our manager, throws us on the road with our friend's van. Uh, you know, our, our own equipment. You know, and, 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 and he, you know, he's not responsible for that." Seven or eight of us fucking died falling down a ravine. What the reason for your departure from the way? In, in all honesty, it, it was a get, it was leave or get thrown out scenario. Like, and I'm just being honest because uh, you know, I remember that my calls were being avoided. They were pretty much sending me a message. It, yeah. When we went to Europe, November December of '91, we did the European tour. Um, after the Bad Brains tour, we, we went back on our own headline protection measures and. Uh, and it was well received. We had full clubs and everything. And uh, some nights were, were, were there was nobody there. But when we got back, I think you know all these guys did when we were on the bus and on the planes. Listen, AJ, Pokey, and and Jimmy Poodle, we call him Jimmy yeah. uh They were listening to Temple of the Dog, Nirvana, and Soundgarden. And I think it got into. I think it drove AJ a little like look at all these bands that are just blowing by us with one guitars, and they they just wanted to go back to a one guitar simpler arrangement. Yeah. And I, I remember one of my last conversations I had with Danny Ilchuk, who was managing the I mean, the Bad Brains crew chief. Yeah. He was managing him. And I said, listen, I think you guys are going, you want me out? I'm, I'm fine. You, you know, you're saving me face. And I, but I, I think you guys are going about, about the wrong way. Everybody's going to be following this trend now with the Nirvana and the Seattle thing and the sub pop movement. And we should go back to Born to Expire. Give them something to hold on to. Go back to our roots. And nobody wanted to hear it. So... That, that's what I think happened. But then again, the band actually, when we got back from Europe, we did the show with the Sick of It All at the Marquee. The band broke up for a while. The band just said, because of the lack of opportunity, yeah. there was no interest in record labels. The band was just digressing in every way, shape, or form. Nobody was coming around. Nobody was asking questions anymore. Nobody was like, who's representing you? 
Leeway are often credited as being one of the most influential and exploratory bands to emerge from the New York hardcore scene. Guitarist and songwriter AJ Novello said of their career, quote, we might have helped open up a can of worms by bringing suburban metalheads to shows. Years later, it kind of ruined things in the scene, but I can't say I have any regrets. Does that make sense? Somewhat, and then uh, no at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I guess we all have our own particular opinion and the way we want to phrase it and everything. But by the time Born to Expire came out, you know, this music scene wasn't even a decade old just yet. We were yeah. still defining ourselves. We were going into this renaissance wave that brought a lot of the musicianship and sounds that came from early or, or underground metal from the 80s. But we also did lose, you know, our, our core roots and, and beginnings from this between the slam dance and the stage dot. You know, we, we called it dancing. We didn't call it moshing. Shane D here, your best friend in the entire world, back with some crossover, some thrash, some metal, some crossover with a band called Leeway. I've heard one or two songs from these guys. I always saw the logo. I always saw people wearing the t-shirts and stuff, and I always said, i got to check that band out, but for years and years and years, I never did. Today, is ch that's all changing. We are checking out some Leeway today with the top jam that they've got, Enforcer. So, without further ado, this is the Magic Titty. It gives us the mother's milk. It takes us into the world of Lee Wei and the song Enforcer. There you go. Yeah, I'm going to go back and listen to that whole album. I, I enjoyed that. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I thought it was pretty damn good. Not, I mean, that old school sound. You know, you've got the hardcore, you've got the punk, you've got the metal, and then they start to mish ma and make love together. And then you've got this kind of crossover sound, and it's fantastic, right? On the outside, every love. went back out with these guys again in 2006. What brought that up on? Uh, it was just a reunion tour for Europe. I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe it myself. AJ called me and says, hey, you want to do a reunion tour? CBs of the Bad Brains, two nights. Yeah. Uh, we did it uh, ourselves in June. Uh, we, we did a few, sh one show in Pensy, one in Jersey, uh, maybe one in New England. I can't remember exactly where, somewhere down the Jersey Shore, too. And then we just went to Europe. And the European tour was excellent because we got to play, like, you know, the Full Force Festival, yeah. Hellfest, Clisson, Eindhoven, Clisson France, and Eindhoven. All, all, the, all the big festivals that I've seen other bands play, we were actually on. We, 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 Got built in with Mur um, not Murphy's Law, but <laughs> Celtic Frost and uh, and Motorhead. <laughs> the minute we landed in Amsterdam International, the minute we touched down, I said to myself, "What the hell am I doing here? What did I do to myself again?" We get there. One guy, no road crew. I don't even mind not having a tour bus. I didn't give a shit about that. 
I, I, I get with seats to sit in and sleep in. I didn't have to do any driving, which was good for the European tours. But um, again, you see one guy cruising around. Yeah, I remember he made an, uh, his name is Chris, Big Rock. Really good guy, good guy, professional. He said, uh, oh, we got a squat tomorrow night. And I remember saying, what do you mean we got a squat tomorrow night? He was like, yeah, you, you know, we're sleeping in a squat. Like, like, you know, where people live with no water and fucking no heat and broken windows. And, like, where Harley Fleming cut his teeth downtown and on Avenue C. And I said, dude, I'm fucking 37 years of age. I'm a, I'm a, I have a career at home. I, I, I earn more from my cover band because I started doing cover bands. Playing Judas Priest and Led Zeppelin in bars for free beer and free food and fucking 200 bucks in your pocket. And I said, dude, I don't do fucking squats. I just don't do it. Not, I, I don't. So I booked a hotel room for myself. And then I let everybody else, I, I, then I said, yeah, yeah I, I booked it on my own uh, credit card and everybody else joined me. I said, fellas, I'll pay for it. Any squat comes up, it's on, it's on me. I don't do fucking squats. Like, what the fuck, a squat? You did, people, musicians, don't sell yourself short. You deserve more than that. But why do we keep selling ourselves short? There's got to be some sort of Elon Musk millionaire, trillionaire, billionaire out there that will invest in anybody. But I guess I was wrong. <laughs> Their song, Enforcer, was featured on the playlist of the radio show LCHC in the game Grand Theft Auto 4 in 2008. Yeah, and it was the last uh, leeway licensing ever done on an animated video game because I was so annoyed that they made millions in advance. And when it was released, they still had not paid the licensing fees to everybody so I got I got written up like on in the daily news for that shit. You know what I mean? Because I actually called the daily news and say you should be talking about this. They should limit Rob Castoria's content until I don't get to talk because he really sucks. Um, anyway, uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> give him sucks. Give him sucks. Give him sucks. Give him sucks. Hey, this is Jeff Tate in Ireland, and Gibbons, you suck. <laughs> now, if you haven't noticed the Facebook band, yeah, it goes back no, and I mean, there's, a, there's always something like, oh, sorry. And I was like, and Mike Dwyer, too, and Jeff Funger. Everybody sucks. They, these guys just suck. I, yeah, I've noticed the banjo back before. I was like, this must be some inside yeah, joke. Yeah, these guys are great guitar players. They're all players, but we, we always break each other's rag on each other. But you can visit their page too. If you want to see great guitar playing, go to Jeff Unger's page on Facebook. Go to Rob Castoria's page, Mike Doyer's page. You'll see some really good guitar playing, progressive stuff that if you're a guitar aficionado, <laughs> you'll, you'll really enjoy that kind of stuff. <laughs>
in, but and it's been fun. The big shows were great. Playing in front of the Ritz crowds and Urban Plaza and Roseland and Palladium. That was my last show. We the the, the the riot show at the Palladium with the announcer front, Murphy's Law, Lele. Hey, make sure you put some motherfucking holes in that floor. You ain't gonna use it no more. Unexpected. Good night. May 27th is when we get the record out, so make sure you get it. So I can't tell you, I, I'm, I'm so humbled and, and lucky to be able to have had this been such an integral part of my life and that I could still be relevant and remembered today and supported the way I have been. It's, it's flooring. It's flooring. It's very frustrating when you're there, you're a hair away from it, than being a garage band forever and not knowing anything about it. 